Chapter One of In Search of the Unknown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Eastman. In Search of the Unknown by Robert W. Chambers. To my friend, E. Legrand Beers. My dear Legrand, you and I were early drawn together by a common love of nature. Your researches into the natural history of the tree toad, your observations upon the mud turtles of Providence Township, your experiments with the freshwater lobster, all stimulated my enthusiasm in a scientific direction, which has crystallized in this helpful little book dedicated to you. Pray accept it as an insignificant payment on account for all I owe to you. The Author Preface It appears to the writer that there is urgent need of more nature books, books that are scraped clear of fiction and which display only the carefully articulated skeleton of fact. Hence this little volume, presented with some hesitation and more modesty. Various chapters have, at intervals, appeared in the pages of various publications. The continued narrative is now published for the first time, and the writer trusts that it may inspire enthusiasm for natural and scientific research, and inculcate a passion for accurate observation among the young. The Author April 1st, 1904 Where the slanting forest eaves Shingled tight with greenest leaves Sweep the scented meadow's edge Let us snoop along the edge Let us pry in hidden nooks Laden with our nature books Scaring birds with happy cries Chloroforming butterflies Rooting up each woodland plant, Pinning beetle, fly, and ant, So we may identify What we've ruined by and by. Chapter One Because it all seems so improbable, So horribly impossible to me now, Sitting here safe and sane in my own library, I hesitate to record an episode, which already appears to me less horrible than grotesque. Yet unless this story is written now, I know I shall never have the courage to tell the truth about the matter, not from fear of ridicule, but because I myself shall soon cease to credit what I now know to be true. Yet scarcely a month has elapsed since I heard the stealthy purring of what I believed to be the shulling undertow, Scarcely a month ago, with my own eyes, I saw that which, even now, I am beginning to believe never existed. As for the harbour-master, and the blow I am now striking at the old order of things, but of that I shall not speak, now or later. I shall try to tell the story simply and truthfully, and let my friends testify as to my probity, and the publishers of this book corroborate them. On the twenty-ninth of February I resigned my position under the government, and left Washington to accept an offer from Professor Farrago, whose name he kindly permits me to use, and on the first day of April I entered upon my new and congenial duties as General Superintendent of the Waterfowl Department, connected with the Zoological Gardens then in course of erection at Bronx Park, New York. For a week I followed the routine examining the new foundations, studying the architect's plans, following the surveyors through the Bronx thickets, suggesting arrangements for watercourses and pools destined to be included in the enclosures for swans, geese, pelicans, herons, and such of the waders and swimmers as we might expect to acclimate in Bronx Park. It was at that time the policy of the trustees and officers of the zoological gardens neither to employ collectors nor to send out expeditions in search of specimens. 
the society decided to depend upon voluntary contributions, and I was always busy, part of the day, in dictating answers to correspondents, who wrote offering their services as hunters of big game, collectors of all sorts of fauna, trappers, snarers, and also to those who offered specimens for sale, usually at exorbitant rates. To the proprietors of five-legged kittens, mangy lynxes, moth-eaten coyotes, and dancing bears, I returned courteous but uncompromising refusals, of course first submitting all such letters, together with my replies, to Professor Farrago. One day towards the end of May, however, just as I was leaving Bronx Park to return to town, Professor Lessard, of the reptilian department, called out to me that Professor Farrago wanted to see me a moment. So I put my pipe into my pocket again, and retraced my steps to the temporary wooden building occupied by Professor Farrago, general superintendent of the zoological gardens. The professor, who was sitting at his desk before a pile of letters and replies submitted for approval by me, pushed his glasses down, and looked over them at me with a whimsical smile that suggested amusement, impatience, annoyance, and perhaps a faint trace of apology. "'Now here's a letter,' he said, with a deliberate gesture towards a sheet of paper impaled on a file. "'A letter that I suppose you remember.' He disengaged the sheet of paper and handed it to me. "'Oh, yes,' I replied with a shrug. "'Of course the man is mistaken, or—' "'Or what?' demanded Professor Farrago, tranquilly, wiping his glasses. "'Or a liar,' I replied. After a silence, he leaned back in his chair and bade me read the letter to him again, and I did so with a contemptuous tolerance for the writer, who must have been either a very innocent victim or a very stupid swindler. I said as much to Professor Farrago, but to my surprise he appeared to waver. "'I suppose,' he said, with his nearsighted, embarrassed smile, that nine hundred and ninety-nine men in a thousand would throw that letter aside and condemn the writer as a liar or a fool. In my opinion, said I, he's one or the other. He isn't in mine, said the professor placidly. What? I exclaimed. Here is a man living all alone on a strip of rock and sand between the wilderness and the sea who wants you to send somebody to take charge of a bird that doesn't exist. How do you know, asked Professor Farrago, that the bird in question does not exist? It is generally accepted, I replied sarcastically, that the great auk has been extinct for years. Therefore I may be pardoned for doubting that our correspondent possesses a pair of them alive. Oh, you young fellows, said the professor, smiling wearily, you embark on a theory for destinations that don't exist. He leaned back in his chair, his amused eyes searching space for the imagery that made him smile. Like swimming squirrels, you navigate with the help of heaven and a stiff breeze, but you never land where you hope to, do you? Rather red in the face, I said, don't you believe the great auk to be extinct? Audubon saw the great auk. Who has seen a single specimen since? Nobody, except our correspondent here, he replied, laughing. I laughed too considering the interview at an end, but the professor went on coolly. Whatever it is that our correspondent has, and I am daring to believe that it is the great auk itself, I want you to secure it for the society. When my astonishment subsided, my first conscious sentiment was one of pity. Clearly, Professor Farrago was on the verge of dotage. <sighs> what a loss to the world! I believe now that Professor Farrago perfectly interpreted my thoughts, but he betrayed neither resentment nor impatience. I drew a chair up beside his desk. There was nothing to do but to obey, and this fool's errand was none of my conceiving. 
Together we made out a list of articles necessary for me and itemized the expenses I might incur, and I set a date for my return, allowing no margin for a successful termination to the expedition. "'Never mind that,' said the professor. "'What I want you to do is to get those birds here safely. Now, how many men will you take?' "'None,' I replied bluntly. "'It's a useless expense, unless there is something to bring back. If there is, I'll wire you, you may be sure.' "'Very well,' said Professor Farrago, good-humouredly. "'You shall have all the assistance you may require. Can you leave to-night?' The old gentleman was certainly prompt. I nodded, half sulkily, aware of his amusement. So, I said, picking up my hat, I am to start north to find a place called Black Harbor, where there is a man named Halyard, who possesses, among other household utensils, two extinct great ox. We were both laughing by this time. I asked him why on earth he credited the assertion of a man he had never before heard of. "'I suppose,' he replied, with the same half-apologetic, half-humorous smile, "'it is instinct. I feel somehow that this man Halyard has got an awk, perhaps too. I can't get away from the idea that we are on the eve of acquiring the rarest of living creatures. It's odd for a scientist to talk as I do, Doubtless you're shocked. Admit it now. But I was not shocked. On the contrary, I was conscious that the same strange hope the Professor Farrago cherished was beginning, in spite of me, to stir my pulses too. If he has, I began, then stopped. The Professor and I looked hard at each other in silence. Go on, he said encouragingly but I had nothing more to say, for the prospect of beholding with my own eyes a living specimen of the great auk produced a series of conflicting emotions within me which rendered speech profanely superfluous. As I took my leave, Professor Farrago came to the door of the temporary wooden office and handed me the letter written by the man Halyard. I folded it and put it into my pocket, as Halyard might require it for my own identification. "'How much does he want for the pair?' I asked. Ten thousand dollars. Don't demur. If the birds are really—' "'I know,' I said hastily, not daring to hope too much. "'One more thing,' said Professor Farrago gravely. "'You know, in that last paragraph of his letter, Halyard speaks of something else in the way of specimens.' an undiscovered species of amphibious biped. Just read that paragraph again, will you?" I drew the letter from my pocket and read as he directed. When you have seen the two living specimens of the great auk and have satisfied yourself that I tell the truth, you may be wise enough to listen, without prejudice, to a statement I shall make concerning the existence of the strangest creature ever fashioned. I will merely say, at this time, that the creature referred to is an amphibious biped and inhabits the ocean near this coast. More I cannot say, for I personally have not seen the animal, but I have a witness who has, and there are many who affirm that they have seen the creature. You will naturally say that my statement amounts to nothing, but when your representative arrives, if he be free from prejudice, I expect his reports to you concerning this sea biped will confirm the solemn statements of a witness I know to be unimpeachable. Yours truly, Burden Halyard, Black Harbor. Well, I said after a moment's thought, here goes for the wild goose chase. Wild auk, you mean, said Professor Farrago, shaking hands with me. You will start tonight, won't you? Yes, but heaven knows how I'm ever going to land in this man Halyard's dooryard. Good-bye. About that sea biped, began Professor Farrago shyly. Oh, don't, I said. I can swallow the ox, feathers and claws. But if this fellow Halyard is hinting he's seen an amphibious creature resembling a man— 
or a woman, said the professor cautiously. I retired, disgusted, my faith shaken in the mental vigor of Professor Farrago. End of chapter one. Chapter two of In Search of the Unknown by Robert W. Chambers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. Chapter two. The three days' voyage by boat and rail was irksome. I bought my kit at St. Croix on the Central Pacific Railroad, and on June 1st I began the last stage of my journey via the Santa Sol broad gauge, arriving in the wilderness by daylight. A tedious forced march by blazed trail, freshly spotted on the wrong side, of course, brought me to the northern terminus of the rusty, narrow-gauge lumber railway, which runs from the heart of the hushed pine wilderness to the sea. Already a long train of battered flat cars, piled with sluice props and roughly hewn sleepers, was moving slowly off into the brooding forest gloom when I came in sight of the track. But I developed a gratifying and unexpected burst of speed, shouting all the while. The train stopped. I swung myself aboard the last car, where a pleasant young fellow was sitting on the rear brake, chewing spruce and reading a letter. "'Come aboard, sir,' he said, looking up with a smile. "'I guess you're the man in a hurry.' "'I'm looking for a man named Halyard,' I said, dropping rifle and knapsack on the fresh-cut, fragrant pile of pine. "'Are you Halyard?' "'No, I'm Francis Lee, bossing the mica pit at Port of Waves,' he replied. "'But this letter is from Halyard, asking me to look out for a man in a hurry from Bronx Park, New York.' "'I'm that man,' said I, filling my pipe and offering him a share of the weed of peace.' and we sat side by side, smoking very amiably, until a signal from the locomotive sent him forward, and I was left alone, lounging at ease, head pillowed on both arms, watching the blue sky flying through the branches overhead. Long before we came in sight of the ocean I smelled it. The fresh salt aroma stole into my senses, drowsy with the heated odor of pine and hemlock and I sat up, peering ahead into the dusky sea of pines. Fresher and fresher came the wind from the sea, in puffs, in mild sweet breezes, in steady freshening currents, blowing the feathery crowns of the pines, setting the balsam's blue tufts rocking. Lee wandered back over the long line of flats, balancing himself nonchalantly as the cars swung around a sharp curve, where water dripped from a newly propped sluice that suddenly emerged from the depths of the forest to run parallel to the railroad track. "'Build it this spring,' he said, surveying his handiwork, which seemed to undulate as the cars swept past. "'It runs to the cove, or ought to.' He stopped abruptly, with a thoughtful glance at me. "'So you're going over to Halyards,' he continued as though answering a question asked by himself. I nodded. You've never been there, of course. No, I said, and I'm not likely to go again. I would have told him why I was going if I had not already begun to feel ashamed of my idiotic errand. I guess you're going to look at those birds of his, continued Lee placidly. I guess I am. I said sulkily, glancing askance to see whether he was smiling. But he only asked me, quite seriously, whether a great hawk was really a very rare bird, and I told him that the last one ever seen had been found dead off Labrador in January 1870. Then I asked him whether these birds of halyards were really great auks, and he replied, somewhat indifferently, that he supposed they were, at least nobody had ever before seen such birds near Port of Waves. "'There's something else,' he said, running a pine sliver through his pipe-stem, "'something that interests us all here more than ox, big or little. I suppose I might as well speak of it, 
as you are bound to hear about it sooner or later. He hesitated, and I could see that he was embarrassed, searching for the exact words to convey his meaning. If, said I, you have anything in this region more important to science than the great auk, I should be very glad to know about it. Perhaps there was the faintest tinge of sarcasm in my voice, for he shot a sharp glance at me, and then turned slightly. After a moment, however, he put his pipe into his pocket, laid hold of the brake with both hands, vaulted to his perch aloft, and glanced down at me. "'Did you ever hear of the harbour-master?' he asked maliciously. "'Which harbour-master?' I inquired. "'You'll know before long,' he observed, with a satisfied glance into perspective. This rather extraordinary observation puzzled me. I waited for him to resume, and as he did not, I asked him what he meant. "'If I knew,' he said, "'I'd tell you. But, come to think of it, I'd be a fool to go into details with a scientific man. You'll hear about the harbour-master. Perhaps you will see the harbour-master. In that event, I should be glad to converse with you on the subject." I could not help laughing at his prim and precise manner, and after a moment he also laughed, saying, "'It hurts a man's vanity to know he knows a thing that somebody else knows he doesn't know. I'm damned if I say another word about the harbour-master until you've been to Halyards.' "'A harbour-master,' I persisted, is an official who superintends the mooring of ships, isn't he?" But he refused to be tempted into conversation, and we lounged silently on the lumber, until a long thin whistle from the locomotive and a rush of stinging salt wind brought us to our feet. Through the trees I could see the bluish-black ocean, stretching out beyond black headlands to meet the clouds. A great wind was roaring among the trees as the train slowly came to a standstill on the edge of the primeval forest. Lee jumped to the ground and aided me with my rifle and pack, and then the train began to back away along a curved side-track, which, Lee said, led to the mica pit and company stores. "'Now what will you do?' he asked pleasantly. "'I can give you a good dinner and a decent bed tonight if you like.' and I'm sure Mrs. Lee would be very glad to have you stop with us as long as you choose." I thanked him, but said that I was anxious to reach Halyards before dark, and he very kindly led me along the cliffs and pointed out the path. "'This man, Halyard, he said, is an invalid. He lives at a cove called Black Harbor, and all his truck goes through to him over the company's road. We receive it here and send a pack mule through once a month. I've met him. He's a bad-tempered hypochondriac, a cynic at heart, and a man whose word is never doubted. If he says he has a great auk, you may be satisfied he has." My heart was beating with excitement at the prospect. I looked out across the wooded headlands and tangled stretches of dune and hollow, trying to realize what it might mean to me, to Professor Farrago, to the world if I should lead back to New York a live auk. "'He's a crank,' said Lee. "'Frankly, I don't like him. If you find it unpleasant there, come back to us.' "'Does Halyard live alone?' I asked. "'Yes, except for a professional trained nurse. <laughs> Poor thing.' "'A man?' "'No,' said Lee disgustedly. Presently he gave me a peculiar glance, hesitated, and finally said, "'Ask Halyard to tell you about his nurse and the harbour-master. Goodbye. I'm due at the quarry. Come and stay with us whenever you care to. You will find a welcome at Port of Waves.' We shook hands and parted on the cliff, he turning back into the forest along the railway, I starting northward, pack slung, rifle over my shoulder. Once I met a group of quarrymen, faces burned brick-red, scarred hands swinging as they walked. And as I passed them with a nod, turning, I saw that they also had turned to look after me, 
and I caught a word or two of their conversation, whirled back to me on the sea wind. They were speaking of the harbor-master. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of In Search of the Unknown by Robert W. Chambers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. Chapter Three Towards sunset, I came out on a sheer granite cliff where the seabirds were whirling and clamoring, and the great breakers dashed, rolling in double thundered reverberations on the sun-dyed crimson sands below the rock. Across the half-moon of beach towered another cliff, and behind this I saw a column of smoke rising in the still air. It certainly came from Halyard's chimney, although the opposite cliff prevented me from seeing the house itself. I rested a moment to refill my pipe, then resumed rifle and pack, and cautiously started to skirt the cliffs. I had descended halfway towards the beach and was examining the cliff opposite, when something on the very top of the rock arrested my attention, a man darkly outlined against the sky. The next moment, however, I knew it could not be a man, for the object suddenly glided over the face of the cliff and slid down the sheer smooth face like a lizard. Before I could get a square look at it, the thing crawled into the surf, or at least it seemed to, but the whole episode occurred so suddenly, so unexpectedly, that I was not sure I had seen anything at all. However, I was curious enough to climb the cliff on the land side and make my way towards the spot where I imagined I saw the man. Of course, there was nothing there, not a trace of a human being, I mean. Something had been there, a sea otter possibly, for the remains of a freshly killed fish lay on the rock, eaten to the backbone and tail. The next moment below me I saw the house, a freshly painted, trim, flimsy structure, modern and very much out of harmony with the splendid savagery surrounding it. It struck a nasty, cheap note in the noble grey monotony of headland and sea. The descent was easy enough. I crossed the crescent beach, hard as pink marble, and found a little trodden path among the rocks that led to the front porch of the house. There were two people on the porch. I heard their voices before I saw them, and when I set my foot upon the wooden steps I saw one of them, a woman, rise from her chair and step hastily towards me. "'Come back!' cried the other, a man with a smooth-shaven, deeply-lined face and a pair of angry blue eyes. And the woman stepped back quietly, acknowledging my lifted hat, with a silent inclination. The man, who was reclining in an invalid's rolling chair, clapped both large pale hands to the wheels and pushed himself out along the porch. He had shawls pinned about him, an untidy, drab-colored hat on his head, and when he looked down at me he scowled. "'I know who you are,' he said in his acid voice. You're one of the zoological men from Bronx Park. You look like it anyway. It is easy to recognize you from your reputation, I replied, irritated at his discourtesy. Really, he replied, with something between a sneer and a laugh. I'm obliged for your frankness. You're after my great ox, are you not? Nothing else would have tempted me into this place. I replied sincerely. Thank heaven for that, he said. Sit down a moment, you've interrupted us. Then, turning to the young woman, who wore the neat gown and tiny cap of a professional nurse, he bade her resume what she had been saying. She did so with deprecating glance at me, which made the old man sneer again. It happened so suddenly, 
she said in her low voice, that I had no chance to get back. The boat was drifting in the cove. I sat in the stern reading, both oars shipped and the tiller swinging. Then I heard a scratching under the boat, but thought it might be seaweed. And next moment came those soft thumpings, like the sound of a big fish rubbing its nose against a float. Halyard clutched the wheels of his chair and stared at the girl in grim displeasure. "'Didn't you know enough to be frightened?' he demanded. "'No, not then,' she said, colouring faintly. "'But when, after a few moments, I looked up and saw the harbour-master running up and down the beach, I was horribly frightened.' "'Really?' said Halyard sarcastically. "'It was about time!' Then, turning to me, he rasped out, "'And that young lady was obliged to row all the way to Port of Waves "'and call to Lee's quarrymen to take her boat in.' Completely mystified, I looked from Halyard to the girl, not in the least comprehending what all this meant. "'That will do,' said Halyard ungraciously, which curt phrase was apparently the usual dismissal for the nurse. She rose, and I rose, and she passed me with an inclination, stepping noiselessly into the house. "'I want beef tea!' bawled Halyard after her. Then he gave me an unamiable glance. "'I was a well-bred man,' he sneered. "'I'm a Harford graduate, too. But I live as I like, and I do what I like, and I say what I like.' "'You certainly are not reticent.' I said, disgusted. "'Why should I be?' he rasped. "'I pay that young woman for my irritability. It's a bargain between us.' "'In your domestic affairs,' I said, "'there is nothing that interests me. I came to see those ox.' "'You probably believe them to be razor-billed ox,' he said contemptuously. "'But they're not. They're great ox.' I suggested that he permit me to examine them and he replied indifferently that they were in a pen in his backyard, and that I was free to step around the house when I cared to. I laid my rifle and pack on the veranda, and hastened off with mixed emotions, among which hope no longer predominated. No man in his senses would keep two such precious prizes in a pen in his backyard, I argued, and I was perfectly prepared to find anything from a puffin to a penguin in that pen. I shall never forget, as long as I live, my stupor of amazement when I came to the wire-covered enclosure. Not only were there two great ox in the pen, alive, breathing, squatting in bulky majesty on their seaweed bed, but one of them was gravely contemplating two newly hatched chicks, all bill and feet, which nestled sedately at the edge of a puddle of salt water, where some small fish were swimming. For a while excitement blinded, nay, deafened me. I tried to realize that I was gazing upon the last individuals of an all but extinct race, the sole survivors of the gigantic auk, which for thirty years has been accounted an extinct creature. I believe that I did not move muscle nor limb until the sun had gone down and the crowding darkness blurred my straining eyes and blotted the great, silent, bright-eyed birds from sight. Even then I could not tear myself away from the enclosure. I listened to the strange, drowsy note of the male bird, the fainter responses of the female, the thin plaints of the chicks huddling under her breast. I heard their flipper-like, embryotic wings beating sleepily as the birds stretched and yawned their beaks and clacked them, preparing for slumber. "'If you please,' came a soft voice from the door, "'Mr. Halyard awaits your company to dinner.' End of chapter 3。Chapter 4 of In Search of the Unknown by Robert W. Chambers. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. Chapter Four. I dined well, or rather, I might have enjoyed my dinner if Mr. Halyard had been eliminated, and the feast consisted exclusively of a joint of beef, the pretty nurse, and myself. She was exceedingly attractive, with a disturbing fashion of lowering her head and raising her dark eyes when spoken to. As for Halyard, he was unspeakable, bundled up in his snuffy shawls and making uncouth noises over his gruel. But it is only just to say that his table was worth sitting down to, and his wine was sound as a bell. Yah! he snapped. I'm sick of this cursed soup, and I'll trouble you to fill my glass. It is dangerous for you to touch claret, said the pretty nurse. I might as well die at dinner as anywhere, he observed. Certainly, said I, cheerfully passing the decanter, but he did not appear over-pleased with the attention. I can't smoke either, he snarled, hitching the shawls around until he looked like Richard the Third. However, he was good enough to shove a box of cigars at me, and I took one and stood up, as the pretty nurse slipped past and vanished into the little parlour beyond. We sat there for a while without speaking. He picked irritably at the bread-crumbs on the cloth, never glancing in my direction, and I, tired from my long foot-tour, lay back in my chair silently appreciating one of the best cigars I ever smoked. "'Well,' he rasped out at length, "'what do you think of my ox and my veracity?' I told him that both were unimpeachable. "'Didn't they call me a swindler down there at your museum?' he demanded. I admitted that I had heard the term applied. Then I made a clean breast of the matter, telling him that it was I who had doubted, that my chief, Professor Farrago, had sent me against my will, and that I was ready and glad to admit that he, Mr. Halyard, was a benefactor of the human race. Bosh, he said, what good does a confounded wobbly bandy-toed bird do to the human race? But he was pleased nevertheless, and presently he asked me, not unamiably, to punish his claret again. "'I'm done for,' he said. "'Good things to eat and drink are no good to me. Some day I'll get mad enough to have a fit, and then—' He paused to yawn. "'Then,' he continued, "'that little nurse of mine will drink up my claret and go back to civilization, where people are polite.' Somehow or other— in spite of the fact that Halyard was an old pig, what he said touched me. There was certainly not much left in life for him, as he regarded life. "'I'm going to leave her this house,' he said, arranging his shawls. "'She doesn't know it. I'm going to leave her my money, too. She doesn't know that. Good Lord, what kind of a woman can she be to stand my bad temper for a few dollars a month?' I think, said I, that it's partly because she's poor, partly because she's sorry for you. He looked up with a ghastly smile. You think she really is sorry? Before I could answer, he went on. I'm no mawkish sentimentalist, and I won't allow anybody to be sorry for me. Do you hear? Oh, I'm not sorry for you, I said hastily and for the first time since I had seen him, he laughed heartily, without a sneer. We both seemed to feel better after that. I drank his wine and smoked his cigars, and he appeared to take a certain grim pleasure in watching me. "'There's no fool like a young fool,' he observed presently. As I had no doubt he referred to me, I paid him no attention. After fidgeting with his shawls, he gave me an oblique scowl and asked me my age. Twenty-four, I replied. 
sort of a tadpole, aren't you? he said. As I took no offense, he repeated the remark. Oh, come, said I, there's no use in trying to irritate me. I see through you. A row acts like a cocktail on you, but you'll have to stick to gruel in my company. I call that impudence, he rasped out wrathfully. I don't care what you call it, I replied undisturbed. I am not going to be worried by you. Anyway, I ended, it is my opinion that you could be very good company if you chose. The proposition appeared to take his breath away. At least he said nothing more, and I finished my cigar in peace and tossed the stump into a saucer. Now, said I, what price do you set upon your birds, Mr. Halyard? Ten thousand dollars, he snapped with an evil smile. You will receive a certified check when the birds are delivered, I said quietly. You don't mean to say you agree to that outrageous bargain, and I won't take a cent less either. Good Lord, haven't you any spirit left? he cried, half rising from his pile of shawls. His piteous eagerness for a dispute sent me into laughter impossible to control, and he eyed me mouth open, animosity rising visibly. Then he seized the wheels of his invalid chair and trundled away, too mad to speak, and I strolled out into the parlor, still laughing. The pretty nurse was there, sewing under a hanging lamp. If I am not indiscreet, I began. Indiscretion is the better part of valor, said she, dropping her head, but raising her eyes. So I sat down, with a frivolous smile peculiar to the appreciated. Doubtless, said I, you are hemming a kerchief. Doubtless I am not, she said. This is a nightcap for Mr. Halyard. A mental vision of Halyard in a nightcap, very mad, nearly set me laughing again. Like the King of Yvetot, he wears his crown in bed, I said flippantly. The King of Yvetot might have made that remark, she observed, rethreading her needle. It is unpleasant to be reproved. How large and red and hot a man's ears feel. To cool them, I strolled out to the porch, and after a while the pretty nurse came out too, and sat down in a chair not far away. She probably regretted her lost opportunity to be flirted with. I have so little company, it is a great relief to see somebody from the world, she said. If you can be agreeable, I wish you would. The idea that she had come out to see me was so agreeable that I remained speechless until she said, Do tell me what people are doing in New York. So I seated myself on the steps and talked about the portion of the world inhabited by me, while she sat sewing in the dull light that straggled out from the parlor windows. She had a certain coquetry of her own, using the usual methods with an individuality that was certainly fetching. For instance, when she lost her needle, and another time when we both on hands and knees hunted for her thimble. However, directions for these pastimes may be found in contemporary classics. I was as entertaining as I could be, perhaps not quite as entertaining as a young man usually thinks he is. However, we got on very well together, until I asked her tenderly, who the harbour-master might be, whom they all discussed so mysteriously. "'I do not care to speak about it,' she said, with a primness of which I had not suspected her capable. Of course I could scarcely pursue the subject after that, and indeed I did not intend to, so I began to tell her how I fancied I had seen a man on the cliff that afternoon, and how the creature slid over the sheer rock like a snake. To my amazement, she asked me to kindly discontinue the account of my adventures, in an icy tone, which left no room for protest. It was only a sea otter, I tried to explain, 
thinking perhaps she did not care for snake stories. But the explanation did not appear to interest her, and I was mortified to observe that my impression upon her was anything but pleasant. She doesn't seem to like me and my stories, thought I, but she is too young perhaps to appreciate them. So I forgave her, for she was even prettier than I had thought her at first, and I took my leave, saying that Mr. Halyard would doubtless direct me to my room. Halyard was in his library, cleaning a revolver when I entered. "'Your room is next to mine,' he said. "'Pleasant dreams, and kindly refrain from snoring.' "'May I venture an absurd hope that you will do the same?' I replied politely. That maddened him, so I hastily withdrew. I had been asleep for at least two hours when a movement by my bedside and a light in my eyes awakened me. I sat bolt upright in bed, blinking at Halyard, who, clad in a dressing gown and wearing a nightcap, had wheeled himself into my room with one hand, while with the other he solemnly waved a candle over my head. "'I'm so cursed lonely,' he said. "'Come, there's a good fellow. Talk to me in your own original, impudent way.' I objected strenuously, but he looked so worn and thin, so lonely and bad-tempered, so lovelessly grotesque, that I got out of bed and passed a spongeful of cold water over my head. Then I returned to bed and propped the pillows up for a backrest, ready to quarrel with him if it might bring some little pleasure into his morbid existence. No, he said amiably, I'm too worried to quarrel, but I'm much obliged for your kindly offer. I want to tell you something. What? I asked suspiciously. I want to ask you if you ever saw a man with gills like a fish. Gills? I repeated. Yes, gills. Did you? No, I replied angrily, and neither did you. No, I never did, he said, in a curiously placid voice. But there's a man with gills like a fish who lives in the ocean out there. Oh, you needn't look that way. Nobody ever thinks of doubting my word, and I tell you that there's a man, or a thing that looks like a man, as big as you are, too all slate-colored, with nasty red gills like a fish, and I've a witness to prove what I say. Who? I asked sarcastically. The witness? My nurse. Oh, she saw a slate-colored man with gills? Yes, she did. So did Francis Lee, superintendent of the Mica Quarry Company at Port of Waves. So have a dozen men who work in the quarry. Oh, you needn't laugh, young man. It's an old story here, and anybody can tell you about the harbor master. The harbor master! I exclaimed. Yes, that slate colored thing with gills that looks like a man, and by heaven is a man! That's the harbor master! Ask any quarryman at Port of Waves what it is that comes purring around their boats at the wharf, and unties painters and changes the mooring of every catboat in the cove at night. Ask Francis Lee what it was he saw running and leaping up and down the shoal at sunset last Friday. Ask anybody along the coast what sort of a thing moves about the cliffs like a man and slides over them into the sea like an otter. I saw it do that, I burst out. Oh, did you? Well, what was it? Something kept me silent, although a dozen explanations flew to my lips. After a pause, Halyard said, You saw the harbor master. That's what you saw. I looked at him without a word. Don't mistake me, he said pettishly. I don't think that the harbor master is a spirit or a sprite or a hobgoblin or any sort of damned rot. Neither do I believe it to be an optical illusion. What do you think it is? I asked. I think it's a man. I think it's a branch of the human race. That's what I think. Let me tell you something. The deepest spot in the Atlantic Ocean is a trifle over five miles deep, 
and I suppose you know that this place lies only about a quarter of a mile off this headland. The British exploring vessel, Gull, Captain Marat, discovered and sounded it, I believe. Anyway, it's there, and it's my belief that the profound depths are inhabited by the remnants of the last race of amphibious human beings. This was childish. I did not bother to reply. Believe it or not, as you will, he said angrily. One thing I know, and that is this. The harbor master has taken to hanging around my cove, and he is attracted by my nurse. I won't have it. I'll blow his fishy gills out of his head if I ever get a shot at him. I don't care whether it's homicide or not. Anyway, it's a new kind of murder, and it attracts me. I gazed at him incredulously, but he was working himself into a passion, and I did not choose to say what I thought. Yes, this slate-colored thing with gills goes purring and grinning and spitting about after my nurse, when she walks, when she rows, when she sits on the beach. Cad, it drives me nearly frantic. I won't tolerate it, I tell you. No, said I, I wouldn't either and I rolled over in bed, convulsed with laughter. The next moment I heard my door slam. I smothered my mirth and rose to close the window, for the land wind blew cold from the forest, and a drizzle was sweeping the carpet as far as my bed. That luminous glare which sometimes lingers after the stars go out threw a trembling, nebulous radiance over sand and cove. I heard the seething currents under the breakers softened thunder, louder than I ever heard it. Then, as I closed my window, lingering for a last look at the crawling tide, I saw a man standing ankle-deep in the surf, all alone there in the night. But was it a man? For the figure suddenly began running over the beach on all fours like a beetle, waving its limbs like feelers. Before I could throw open the window again, it darted into the surf, and when I leaned out into the chilling drizzle, I saw nothing save the flat ebb crawling on the coast. I heard nothing save the purring of bubbles on seething sands. End of chapter 4《In Search of the Unknown》by Robert W. Chambers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. Chapter 5 It took me a week to perfect my arrangements for transporting the great ox by water to Port of Waves, where a lumber schooner was to be sent from Petit saint Isole, chartered by me for a voyage to New York. I had constructed a cage made of osiers, in which my ox were to squat until they arrived at Bronx Park. My telegrams to Professor Farraga were brief. One merely said, Victory! Another explained that I wanted no assistance. And a third read, Schooner chartered. Arrive New York July 1st. Send furniture van to foot of Bluff Street. My week as a guest of Mr. Halyard proved interesting. I wrangled with that invalid to his heart's content. I worked all day on my osier cage. I hunted the thimble in the moonlight with the pretty nurse. We sometimes found it. As for the thing they called the harbor master, I saw it a dozen times, but always either at night or so far away and so close to the sea that of course no trace of it remained when I reached the spot, rifle in hand. I had quite made up my mind that the so-called harbor-master was a demented darky, wandered from heaven knows where, perhaps shipwrecked and gone mad from his sufferings. Still, it was far from pleasant to know that the creature was strongly attracted by the pretty nurse. She, however, persisted in regarding the harbor-master as a sea-creature, she earnestly affirmed that it had gills like a fish's gills, that it had a soft fleshy hole for a mouth, 
and its eyes were luminous and lidless and fixed. Besides, she said with a shudder, it's all slate-color like a porpoise, and it looks as wet as a sheet of India rubber in a dissecting room. The day before I was to set sail with my ox in a cat-boat bound for Port of Waves, Halyard trundled up to me in his chair and announced his intention of going with me. "'Going where?' I asked. "'To Port of Waves and then to New York,' he replied tranquilly. I was doubtful, and my lack of cordiality hurt his feelings. "'Of course, if you need the sea voyage,' I began. "'I don't. I need you,' he said savagely. "'I need the stimulus of our daily quarrel. I never disagreed so pleasantly with anybody in my life. It agrees with me. I am a hundred percent better than I was last week. I was inclined to resent this, but something in the deep-lined face of the invalid softened me. Besides, I had taken a hearty liking to the old pig. I don't want any mawkish sentiment about it, he said, observing me closely. I won't permit anybody to feel sorry for me. Do you understand? I'll trouble you to use a different tone in addressing me, I replied hotly. I'll feel sorry for you if I choose to. And our usual quarrel proceeded to his deep satisfaction. By six o'clock next evening, I had Halyard's luggage stowed away in the catboat, and the pretty nurse's effects courted down with the newly hatched auk chicks in a hat-box on top. She and I placed the osier cage aboard, securing it firmly, and then, throwing tablecloths over the auk's heads, we led those simple and dignified birds down the path and across the plank at the little wooden pier. Together we locked up the house, while Halyard stormed at us both and wheeled himself furiously up and down the beach below. At the last moment she forgot her thimble, but we found it, I forget where. "'Come on!' shouted Halyard, waving his shawls furiously. "'What the devil are you about up there?' He received our explanation with a sniff, and we trundled him aboard without further ceremony. "'Don't run me across the plank like a steamer trunk!' he shouted as I shot him dexterously into the cockpit. But the wind was dying away, and I had no time to dispute with him then. The sun was setting above the pine-clad ridge as our sail flapped and partly filled, and I cast off and began a long tack, east by south, to avoid the spouting rocks on our starboard bow. The seabirds rose in clouds as we swung across the shoal, the black surf-ducks scuttered out to sea. The gulls tossed their sun-tipped wings in the ocean, riding the rollers like bits of froth. Already we were sailing slowly out across that great hole in the ocean, five miles deep, the most profound sounding ever taken in the Atlantic. The presence of great heights or great depths, seen or unseen, always impresses the human mind, perhaps oppresses it. We were very silent. The sunlight stain on cliff and beach deepened to crimson, then faded into somber purple bloom that lingered long after the rose tint died out in the zenith. Our progress was slow. At times, although the sail filled with the rising land breeze, we scarcely seemed to move at all. Of course, said the pretty nurse. We couldn't be aground in the deepest hole in the Atlantic. Scarcely, said Halyard sarcastically, unless we're grounded on a whale. What's that soft thumping? I asked. Have we run afoul of a barrel or log? It was almost too dark to see, but I leaned over the rail and swept the water with my hand. Instantly something smooth glided under it, like the back of a great fish, and I jerked my hand back to the tiller. At the same moment the whole surface of the water seemed to begin to purr 
with a sound like the breaking of froth in a champagne glass. "'What's the matter with you?' asked Halyard sharply. "'A fish came up under my hand,' I said. "'A porpoise or something.' With a low cry, the pretty nurse clasped my arm in both her hands. "'Listen,' she whispered. "'It's purring around the boat.' "'What the devil's purring?' shouted Halyard. "'I won't have anything purring around me!' At that moment, to my amazement, I saw that the boat had stopped entirely, although the sail was full and the small pennant fluttered from the masthead. Something, too, was tugging at the rudder, twisting and jerking it, until the tiller strained and creaked in my hand. All at once it snapped! The tiller swung useless, and the boat whirled around, heeling in the stiffening wind, and drove shoreward. It was then that I, ducking to escape the boom, caught a glimpse of something ahead, something that a sudden wave seemed to toss on deck and leave there, wet and flapping. A man with round, fixed, fishy eyes and soft, slaty skin. But the horror of the thing were the two gills that swelled and relaxed spasmodically, emitting a rasping, purring sound. Two gasping, blood-red gills, all fluted and scalloped and distended. Frozen with amazement and repugnance, I stared at the creature. I felt the hair stirring on my head and the icy sweat on my forehead. "'It's the harbour-master!' screamed Halyard. The harbour-master had gathered himself into a wet lump, squatting motionless in the bows under the mast. His lidless eyes were phosphorescent, like the eyes of living codfish. After a while I felt that either fright or disgust was going to strangle me where I sat. But it was only the arms of the pretty nurse— clasped around me in a frenzy of terror. There was not a firearm aboard that we could get at. Halyard's hand crept backward where a steel-shod boat-hook lay, and I also made a clutch at it. The next moment I had it in my hand and staggered forward, but the boat was already tumbling shoreward among the breakers, and the next I knew the harbour-master ran at me like a colossal rat just as the boat rolled over and over through the surf, spilling freight and passengers among the seaweed-covered rocks. When I came to myself, I was thrashing about knee-deep in a rocky pool, blinded by the water and half-suffocated, while under my feet, like a stranded porpoise, the harbour-master made the water boil in his efforts to upset me. But his limbs seemed soft and boneless, He had no nails, no teeth, and he bounced and thumped and flapped and splashed like a fish, while I rained blows on him with the boat-hook that sounded like blows on a football. And all the while his gills were blowing out and frothing and purring, and his lidless eyes looked into mine, until nauseated and trembling I dragged myself back to the beach, where already the pretty nurse alternately wrung her hands and her petticoats in ornamental despair. Beyond the cove, Halyard was bobbing up and down, afloat in his invalid's chair, trying to steer shoreward. He was the maddest man I ever saw. "'Have you killed that rubber-headed thing yet?' he roared. "'I can't kill it!' I shouted breathlessly. "'I might as well try to kill a football!' "'Can't you punch a hole in it?' he bawled. "'If I can only get at him!' His words were drowned in a thunderous splashing, a roar of great broad flippers beating the sea. And I saw the gigantic forms of my two great auks, followed by their chicks, blundering past in a shower of spray, driving headlong out into the ocean. "'Oh, Lord!' I said, I can't stand that. And for the first time in my life, I fainted peacefully and appropriately.
at the feet of the pretty nurse. It is within the range of possibility that this story may be doubted. It doesn't matter. Nothing can add to the despair of a man who has lost two great ox. As for Halyard, nothing affects him, except his involuntary sea-bath, and that did him so much good that he writes me from the south that he's going on a walking tour through Switzerland, if I'll join him. I might have joined him if he had not married the pretty nurse. I wonder whether... But, of course, this is no place for speculation. In regard to the harbour-master, you may believe it, or not, as you choose. But if you hear of any great ox being found, kindly throw a tablecloth over their heads and notify the authorities at the New Zoological Gardens in Bronx Park, New York. The reward is ten thousand dollars. End of chapter five. Chapter six of in Search of the Unknown by Robert W. Chambers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. Chapter 6. Before I proceed any further, common decency requires me to reassure my readers concerning my intentions, which heaven knows are far from flippant. To separate fact from fancy has always been difficult for me, but now that I have had the honour to be chosen secretary of the zoological gardens in Bronx Park, I realise keenly that unless I give up writing fiction, nobody will believe what I write about science. Therefore it is to a serious and unimaginative public that I shall hereafter address myself, and I do it in the modest confidence that I shall neither be distrusted nor doubted, although unfortunately I still write in that irrational style which suggests covert frivolity, and for which I am undergoing a course of treatment in English literature at Columbia College. Now, having promised to avoid originality and confine myself to facts, I shall tell what I have to tell concerning the ding, the mammoth, and something else. For some weeks it had been rumoured that Professor Farrago, president of the Bronx Park Zoological Society, would resign to accept an enormous salary as manager of Barnum and Bailey's Circus. He was now with the circus in London, and had promised to cable his decision before the day was over. I hoped he would decide to remain with us. I was his secretary and particular favourite and I viewed, without enthusiasm, the advent of a new president, who might shake us all out of our congenial and carefully excavated ruts. However, it was plain that the trustees of the society expected the resignation of Professor Farrago, for they had been in secret session all day, considering the names of possible candidates to fill Professor Farrago's large, old-fashioned shoes. These preparations worried me, for I can scarcely expect another chief as kind and considerate as Professor Leonidas Farrago. That afternoon in June I left my office in the administration building in Bronx Park and strolled out under the trees for a breath of air. But the heat of the sun soon drove me to seek shelter under a little square arbor, a shady retreat covered with purple wisteria and honeysuckle. As I entered the arbor, I noticed that there were three other people seated there, an elderly lady with masculine features and short hair, a younger lady sitting beside her, and farther away a rough-looking young man reading a book. For a moment I had an indistinct impression of having met the elder lady somewhere and under circumstances not entirely agreeable. But beyond a stony and indifferent glance, she paid no attention to me. As for the younger lady, she did not look at me at all. She was very young, 
with pretty eyes, a mass of silky brown hair, and a skin as fresh as a rose which had just been rained on. With that delicacy peculiar to lonely scientific bachelors, I modestly sat down beside the rough young man, although there was more room beside the younger lady. Some lazy loafer reading a penny dreadful, I thought, glancing at him, then at the title of his book. Hearing me beside him, he turned around and blinked over his shabby shoulder, and the movement uncovered the page he had been silently conning. The volume in his hands was Darwin's famous monograph on the monodactyl. He noticed the astonishment on my face and smiled uneasily, shifting the short clay pipe in his mouth. I guess, he observed, that this here book is too much for me, mister. It's rather technical, I replied, smiling. Yes, he said in vague admiration. It's fierce, ain't it? After a silence, I asked him if he would tell me why he had chosen Darwin as a literary pastime. Well, he said placidly, I was trying to read about animals, but I'm up against a word-slinger this time all right. Now here's a gum-twister. And he painfully spelled out M-O-N-O-D-A-C-T-Y-L breathing hard all the while. Monodactyl, I said, means a single-toed creature. He turned the page with alacrity. Is that the beast he's talking about? he asked. The illustration, he pointed out, was a woodcut, representing Darwin's reconstruction of the ding from the fossil bones in the British Museum. It was a well-executed woodcut, showing a ding in the foreground, and to give scale, a mammoth in the middle distance. Yes, I replied, that is the ding. I've seen one, he observed calmly. I smiled and explained that the ding had been extinct for some thousands of years. Oh, I guess not, he replied with cool optimism. Then he placed a grimy forefinger on the mammoth. I've seen them things, too, he remarked. Again, I patiently pointed out his air, and suggested that he referred to the elephant. Elephant be blowed, he replied scornfully. I guess I know what I've seen, and I've seen that there thing you call a ding, too. Not wishing to prolong a futile discussion, I remained silent. After a moment he wheeled around, removing his pipe from his hard mouth. Did you ever hear tell of Graham's Glacier? he demanded. Certainly, I replied, astonished. It's the southernmost glacier in British America. Right, he said. And did you ever hear tell of the Hudson Mountings, mister? Yes, I replied. What's behind him? he snapped out. Nobody knows, I answered. They are considered impassable. They ain't, though, he said doggedly. I've been behind them. Really, I replied, tiring of his yarn. Yes, really, he repeated sullenly. Then he began to fumble and search through the pages of his book until he found what he wanted. Mister, he said, just read that out loud, please. The passage he indicated was the famous chapter beginning, Is the mammoth extinct? Is the ding extinct? Probably. And yet the aborigines of British America maintain the contrary. Probably both the mammoth and the ding are extinct, but until expeditions have penetrated and explored not only the unknown region in Alaska, but also that hidden tableland beyond the Graham Glacier and the Hudson Mountains, it will not be possible to definitely announce the total extinction of either the mammoth or the ding. When I had read it, slowly, for his benefit, he brought his hand down smartly on one knee and nodded rapidly. Mister, 
he said, that gent knows a thing or two, and don't you forget it. Then he demanded, abruptly, how I knew he hadn't been behind the Graham Glacier. I explained. Shucks, he said, there's a road five miles wide under that there tableland. Mister, I ain't been in New York long. I come in her part a week ago on the Arctic Bell Whaler. I was in the Hudson Range when that there Graham Glacier bust up. What? I exclaimed. Didn't you know it? he asked. Well, maybe it ain't in the papers, but it busted all right. Blowed up by an earthquake and volcano combined. And, mister, it was awful. My, how I did run! Do you mean to tell me that some convulsion of the earth has shattered the Graham Glacier? I asked. Convulsions? Yes, and fits too, he said sulkily. The whole blame thing dropped into a hole. And say, mister, home and mother is good enough for me now. I stared at him stupidly. Once, he said, I catched pelts for them sharps at Hudson Bay, like any yaller husky. But the things I seen arter that convulsion fit, the things I seen behind the Hudson mountings, don't make me hanker arter no life on the Piraire wild, let me tell yer. I may be a mother carry chicken, but this chicken has got enough. After a long silence, I picked up his book again and pointed at the picture of the mammoth. "'What color is it?' I asked. "'Kind of red and brown,' he answered promptly. "'It's woolly, too.' Astounded, I pointed to the ding. "'One toad,' he said quickly, "'makes a noise like a bell when scuttering about.' Intensely excited, I laid my hand on his arm. "'My society will give you a thousand dollars,' I said, if you pilot me inside the Hudson Table Land, and show me either a mammoth or a ding. He looked me calmly in the eye. Mister, he said slowly, have you got a million for to squander on me? No, I said suspiciously. Because, he went on, it wouldn't be enough. Home and mother suits me now. He picked up his book and rose. In vain I asked his name and address. In vain I begged him to dine with me, to become my honored guest. Knit, he said shortly, and shambled off down the path. But I was not going to lose him like that. I rose and deliberately started to stalk him. It was easy. He shuffled along, pulling on his pipe, and I after him. It was growing a little dark, although the sun still reddened the tops of the maples. Afraid of losing him in the falling dusk, I once more approached him and laid my hand upon his ragged sleeve. "'Look here!' he cried, wheeling about. "'I want you to quit follering me. Don't I tell you money can't make me go back to the mountings?' And as I attempted to speak, he suddenly tore off his cap and pointed to his head. His hair was white as snow. "'That's what comes of monkeying into your cursed mountings!' he shouted fiercely. "'There's things in there what no Christian ought to see. Let me alone or I'll bust you!' He shambled on, doubled fists swinging by his side. The next moment, setting my teeth obstinately, I followed him and caught him by the park gate. At my hail he whirled around with a snarl, but I grabbed him by the throat and backed him violently against the park wall. "'You invaluable ruffian,' I said. "'Now you listen to me. I live in that big stone building, and I'll give you a thousand dollars to take me behind the Graham Glacier. Think it over and call on me when you are in a pleasanter frame of mind. If you don't come by noon tomorrow, I'll go to the Graham Glacier without you.' He was attempting to kick me all the time, but I managed to avoid him. And when I had finished, I gave him a shove which almost loosened his spinal column. He went reeling out across the sidewalk, and when he had recovered his breath and his balance, he danced with displeasure, and displayed a vocabulary that astonished me. However, he kept his distance. 
as I turned back into the park, satisfied that he would not follow. The first person I saw was the elderly, stony-faced lady of the wisteria arbor, advancing on tiptoe. Behind her came the younger lady, with cheeks like a rose that had been rained on. Instantly it occurred to me that they had followed us, and at the same moment I knew who the stony-faced lady was. Angry but polite, I lifted my hat and saluted her, and she, probably furious at having been caught tiptoeing after me, cut me dead. The younger lady passed me with face averted, but even in the dusk I could see the tip of one little ear turn scarlet. Walking on hurriedly, I entered the administration building, and found Professor Lessard of the reptilian department preparing to leave. "'Don't you do it,' I said sharply. "'I've got exciting news.' "'I'm only going to the theatre,' he replied. "'It's a good show. Adam and Eve. There's a snake in it, you know. It's in my line.' "'I can't help it,' I said, and I told him briefly what had occurred in the arbor. "'But that's not all,' I continued savagely. "'Those women followed us. "'And who do you think one of them turned out to be? "'Well, it was Professor Small of Barnard College, "'and I'll bet every pair of boots I own "'that she starts for the Graham Glacier within a week. "'Idiot that I was!' I exclaimed, "'smiting my head with both hands. "'I never recognized her "'until I saw her tiptoeing and craning her neck to listen.' Now she knows about the glacier. She heard every word that young ruffian said, and she'll go to the glacier if it's only to forestall me. Professor Lessard looked anxious. He knew that Miss Small, professor of natural history at Barnard College, had long desired an appointment at the Bronx Park Gardens. It was even said she had a chance of succeeding Professor Farrago as president, but that, of course, must have been a joke. However, she haunted the gardens, annoying the keepers by persistently poking the animals with her umbrella. On one occasion she sent us word that she desired to enter the tiger's enclosure for the purpose of making experiments in hypnotism. Professor Farrago was absent, but I took it upon myself to send back word that I feared the tigers might injure her. The miserable small boy who took my message informed her that I was afraid she might injure the tigers, and the unpleasant incident almost cost me my position. "'I am quite convinced,' said I to Professor Lessard, "'that Miss Small is perfectly capable of abusing the information she overheard, and of starting herself to explore a region that by all the laws of decency, justice, and prior claim belongs to me. Well, said Lessard, with a peculiar laugh, it's not certain whether you can go at all. Professor Farrago will authorize me, I said confidently. Professor Farrago has resigned, said Lessard. It was a bolt from a clear sky. "'Good heavens!' I blurted out. "'What will become of the rest of us, then?' "'I don't know,' he replied. "'The trustees are holding a meeting over in the administration building "'to elect a new president for us. "'It depends on the new president what becomes of us.' "'Lessard,' I said hoarsely, "'you don't suppose that they could possibly elect Miss Small as our president, do you?' He looked at me askance and bit his cigar. "'I'd be in a nice position, wouldn't I?' said I anxiously. "'The lady would probably make you walk the plank for that tiger business,' he replied. "'But I didn't do it,' I protested, with sickly eagerness. "'Besides, I explained to her.' He said nothing, and I stared at him, appalled by the possibility of reporting to Professor Small for instructions next morning. "'See here, Lessard,' I said nervously. "'I wish you would step over to the administration building and ask the trustees if I may prepare for this expedition. Will you?' 
he glanced at me sympathetically. It was quite natural for me to wish to secure my position before the new president was elected, especially as there was a chance of the new president being Miss Small. "'You are quite right,' he said. "'The Graham Glacier would be the safest place for you if our next president is to be the Lady of the Tigers.' And he started across the park, puffing his cigar. I sat down on the doorstep to wait for his return, not at all charmed with the prospect. It made me furious, too, to see my ambition nipped with the frost of a possible veto from Miss Small. If she is elected, thought I, there is nothing for me but to resign, to avoid the inconvenience of being shown the door. Oh, I wish I had allowed her to hypnotize the tigers! Thoughts of crime flitted through my mind. Miss Small would not remain president, or anything else very long, if she persisted in her desire for the tigers, and then when she called for help I would pretend not to hear. Aroused from criminal meditation by the return of Professor Lessard, I jumped up and peered into his perplexed eyes. "'They've elected a president,' he said, "'but they won't tell us who the president is until tomorrow. "'You don't think,' I stammered. "'I don't know, but I know this. "'The new president sanctions the expedition to the Graham Glacier "'and directs you to choose an assistant "'and begin preparations for four people.' Overjoyed, I seized his hand and said, Hooray! in a voice weak with emotion. The old dragon isn't elected this time, I added triumphantly. By the way, he said, who was the other dragon with her in the park this evening? I described her in a more modulated voice. Who? observed Professor Lessard. That must be her assistant, Professor Dorothy Van Twiller. She's the prettiest blue stocking in town. With this curious remark, my confrere followed me into my room and wrote down the list of articles I dictated to him. The list included a complete camping equipment for myself and three other men. Am I one of those other men? inquired Lessard, with an unhappy smile. Before I could reply, my door was shoved open, and a figure appeared at the threshold, cap in hand. "'What do you want?' I asked sternly. But my heart was beating high with triumph. The figure shuffled. Then came a subdued voice. "'Mister, I guess I'll go back to the Graham Glacier along with you. I'm Billy Spike, and it kinder scares me to go back to them Hudson Mountains.' But somehow, mister, when you choked me and kinder walked me off my ear, why, mister, I kinder took to you like. There was absolute silence for a minute. Then he said, So if you go, I guess I'll go too, mister. For a thousand dollars? For nothing, he muttered, or what you like. All right, Billy, I said briskly. Just look over those rifles and ammunition, and see that everything's sound. He slowly lifted his tough young face, and gave me a dog-like glance. They were hard eyes, but there was gratitude in them. You'll get your throat slit, whispered Lessard. Not while Billy's with me, I replied cheerfully. Late that night, as I was preparing for pleasant dreams, a knock came on my door, and a telegraph messenger handed me a note, which I read, shivering in my bare feet, although the thermometer marked eighty Fahrenheit. You will immediately leave for the Hudson Mountains via Wellman Bay, Labrador, there to await further instructions. Equipment for yourself and one assistant will include following articles. Here began a list of camping utensils, scientific paraphernalia, and provisions. The steamer Penguin sails at five o'clock tomorrow morning. Kindly find yourself on board at that hour. Any excuse for not complying with these orders will be accepted as your resignation. Susan Small, 
President, Bronx Zoological Society. Lessard! I shouted, trembling with fury. He appeared at his door, chastely draped in pajamas, and he read the insolent letter with terrified alacrity. What are you going to do? Resign? he asked, much frightened. Do? I snarled, grinding my teeth. I'm going! That's what I'm going to do! But, but you can't get ready and catch that steamer, too, he stammered. He did not know me. End of chapter 6「Seven of In Search of the Unknown」by Robert W. Chambers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. Chapter 7 And so it came about that one calm evening towards the end of June, William Spike and I went into camp under the southerly shelter of that vast granite wall called the Hudson Mountains there to await the promised further instructions. It had been a tiresome trip by steamer to Anticosti, from there by schooner to Widgeon Bay, then down the coast and up the Cape Clear River to Port Porpoise. There we bought three pack mules, and started due north on the great fur trail. The second day out we passed Fort Boise, the last outpost of civilization, and on the sixth day we were travelling eastward under the granite mountain parapets. On the evening of the sixth day out from Fort Boise, we went into camp for the last time, before entering the unknown land. I could see it already through my field glasses, and while William was building the fire, I climbed up among the rocks above, and sat down, glasses levelled, to study the prospect. There was nothing either extraordinary or forbidding in the landscape which stretched out beyond. To the right, the solid palisade of granite cut off the view. To the left, the palisade continued, an endless barrier of sheer cliffs crowned with pine and hemlock. But the interesting section of the landscape lay almost directly in front of me, a rent in the mountain wall through which appeared to run a level, arid plain, miles wide, and as smooth and even as a high road. There could be no doubt concerning the significance of that rent in the solid mountain wall, and moreover it was exactly as William Spike had described it. However, I called to him, and he came up from the smoky campfire, axe on shoulder. Yep, he said, squatting beside me. The Graham Glacier used to meander through that there hole, but something went wrong with the earth's innards, and there was a bust-up. And you saw it, William, I said, with a sigh of envy. Hey, seen it? Sure I seen it. I was to Spouten Springs, twenty mile west, with a bale of blue fox and otter pelt. Fust I knew them geysers begun for to groan egregious-like, and I seen the caribou gallopin' hell-bent south. This climate, says I, is too bracin' for me. So I struck a back trail and landed onto a hill. Then them geysers blowed up, one arter the next, and I heard something kinder cave in between here and China. I disremember things what happened. Something throwed me down, but I couldn't stay there, for the blamed ground was runnin' like a river all wavy-like, and the sky hit me on the back of me head. And then, I urged, in that new excitement which every repetition of the story revived. I had heard it all twenty times since we left New York, but mere repetition could not apparently satisfy me. Then, continued William, the whole world kinder went off like a firecracker, and I come to and ran like I know, said I, cutting him short, for I had become wearied of the invariable profanity which lent a lurid ending to his narrative. After that, I continued, you went through the rent in the mountains? Sure. 
and you saw a ding and a creature that resembled a mammoth? Sure, he repeated sulkily. And you saw something else? I always asked this question. It fascinated me to see the sullen fright flicker in William's eyes, and the mechanical backward glance, as though what he had seen might still be behind him. He had never answered this third question but once, and that time he fairly snarled in my face as he growled, I've seen what no Christian ought to see. So when I repeated, And you saw something else, William? He gave me a wicked, frightened leer, and shuffled off to feed the mules. Flattery, entreaties, threats left him unmoved. He never told me what the third thing was that he had seen behind the Hudson Mountains. William had retired to mix up with his mules. I resumed my binoculars and my silent inspection of the great smooth path left by the Graham Glacier when something or other exploded that vast mass of ice into vapor. The arid plain wound out from the unknown country like a river, and I thought then, and think now, that when the glacier was blown into vapor, the vapor descended in the most terrific rain the world has ever seen, and poured through the newly blasted mountain gateway, sweeping the earth to bedrock. To corroborate this theory, miles to the southward, I could see the debris winding out across the land towards Wellman Bay. But as the terminal moraine of the vanished glacier formerly ended there, I could not be certain that my theory was correct. Owing to the formation of the mountains, I could not see more than half a mile into the unknown country. What I could see appeared to be nothing but the continuation of the glacier's path, scored out by the cloudburst and swept as smooth as a floor. Sitting there, my heart beating heavily with excitement, I looked through the evening glow at the endless, pine-crowned mountain wall with its giant's gateway pierced for me. And I thought of all the explorers and the unknown heroes, trappers, Indians, humble naturalists, perhaps, who had attempted to scale that sheer barricade, and had died there or failed, beaten back from those eternal cliffs. Eternal? No, for the Eternal himself had struck the rock, and it had sprung asunder, thundering obedience. In the still evening air, the smoke from the fire below mounted in a straight, slender pillar, like the smoke from those ancient altars, builded before the first blood had been shed on earth. The evening wind stirred the pines. A tiny spring brook made thin harmony among the rocks. A murmur came from the quiet camp. It was William adjuring his mules. In the deepening twilight I descended the hillock, stepping cautiously among the rocks. Then, suddenly, as I stood outside the reddening ring of firelight, far in the depths of the unknown country, far behind the mountain wall, a sound grew on the quiet air. William heard it and turned his face to the mountains. The sound faded to a vibration which was felt not heard. Then once more I began to divine a vibration in the air, gathering in distant volume until it became a sound, lasting the space of a spoken word, fading to vibration, then silence. Was it a cry? I looked at William inquiringly. He had quietly fainted away. I got him to the little brook and poked his head into the icy water, and after a while he sat up pluckily. To an indignant question he replied, "'No, nah, I ain't cussin' you. Let me be, or I'll have fits.' "'Was it that sound that scared you?' I asked. "'Yas,' he replied with a dauntless shiver. "'Was it the voice of the mammoth?' I persisted excitedly. "'Speak, William, or I'll drag you about and kick you.' He replied that it was neither a mammoth nor a ding, and added a strong request for privacy, 
which I was obliged to grant, as I could not torture another word out of him. I slept little that night. The exciting proximity of the unknown land was too much for me. But although I lay awake for hours, I heard nothing except the tinkle of water among the rocks, and the plover calling from some hidden marsh. At daybreak I shot a ptarmigan, which had walked into camp, and the shot set the echoes yelling among the mountains. William, sullen and heavy-eyed, dressed the bird, and we broiled it for breakfast. Neither he nor I alluded to the sound we had heard the night before. He boiled water and cleaned up the mess kit, and I pottered about among the rocks for another ptarmigan. Wearying of this, presently, I returned to the mules and William and sat down for a smoke. "'It strikes me,' I said, "'that our instructions to await further orders are idiotic. How are we to receive further orders here? William did not know. You don't suppose, said I in sudden disgust, that Miss Small believes there is a summer hotel and daily mail service in the Hudson Mountains? William thought perhaps she did suppose something of the sort. It irritated me beyond measure to find myself at last on the very border of the unknown country, and yet checked, held back by the irresponsible orders of a maiden lady named Small. However, my salary depended upon the whim of that maiden lady, and although I fussed and fumed and glared at the mountains through my glasses, I realized that I could not stir without the permission of Miss Small. At times this grotesque situation became almost unbearable, and I often went away by myself and indulged in fantasies, firing my gun off and pretending I had hit Miss Small by mistake. At such moments I would imagine I was free at last to plunge into the strange country, and I would squat on a rock and dream of bagging my first mammoth. The time passed heavily. The tension increased with each new day. I shot ptarmigan and kept our table supplied with brook trout. William chopped wood, conversed with his mules, and cooked very badly. "'See here,' I said one morning, "'we have been in camp a week today, and I can't stand your cooking another minute.' William, who was washing a saucepan, looked up and begged me sarcastically to accept the cordon bleu. But I know only how to cook eggs, and there were no eggs within some hundred miles. To get the flavor of the breakfast out of my mouth, I walked up to my favorite hillock and sat down for a smoke. The next moment, however, I was on my feet, cheering excitedly and shouting for William. "'Here come further instructions at last!' I cried, pointing to the southward, where two dots on the grassy plain were imperceptibly moving in our direction. "'People on mules,' said William, without enthusiasm. "'They must be messengers for us!' I cried in chaste joy. Three cheers for the northward trail, William, and the mischief take miss—' "'Well, never mind now,' I added." On them approaching mules, observed William, there is women. I stared at him for a second, then attempted to strike him. He dodged wearily and repeated his incredible remark. Yas, there is. Women. Two female ladies onto them their mules. Bring me my glasses, I said hoarsely. Bring me those glasses, William, because I shall destroy you if you don't. Somewhat awed by my calm fury, he hastened back to camp and returned with the binoculars. It was a breathless moment. I adjusted the lenses with a steady hand and raised them. Now, of all unexpected sights my fate may reserve for me in the future, I trust, nay, I know, 
that none can ever prove as unwelcome as the sight I perceived through my binoculars. For upon the backs of those distant mules were two women, and the first one was Miss Small. Upon her head she wore a helmet, from which fluttered a green veil. Otherwise she was clothed in tweeds, and at moments she beat upon her mule with a thick umbrella. Surfeited with the sickening spectacle, I sat down on a rock and tried to cry. "'I told you so,' observed William, but I was too tired to attack him. When the caravan rode into camp, I was myself again, smilingly prepared for the worst, and I advanced, cap in hand, followed furtively by William. "'Welcome,' I said, violently injecting joy into my voice. "'Welcome, Professor Small, to the Hudson Mountains.' "'Kindly take my mule,' she said, climbing down to Mother Earth. "'William,' I said with dignity, "'take the lady's mule.' Miss Small gave me a stolid glance, then made directly for the campfire, where a kettle of game broth simmered over the coals. The last I saw of her she was smelling of it, and I turned my back and advanced towards the second lady pilgrim, prepared to be civil until snubbed. Now it is quite certain that never before had William Spike or I beheld so much feminine loveliness in one human body on the back of a mule. She was clad in the daintiest of shooting kilts, yet there was nothing mannish about her except the way she rode the mule, and that only accentuated her adorable femininity. I remembered what Professor Lessard had said about blue stockings, but Miss Dorothy Van Twiller's were grey, turned over at the tops, and disappearing into canvas spats, buckled across a pair of slim shooting boots. "'Welcome,' said I, attempting to restrain a too violent cordiality. "'Welcome, Professor Van Twiller, to the Hudson Mountains.' "'Thank you,' she replied, accepting my assistance very sweetly. "'It is a pleasure to meet a human being again.' I glanced at Miss Small. She was eating game broth, but she resembled a human being in a general way. "'I should very much like to wash my hands,' said Professor Van Twiller, drawing the buckskin gloves from her slim fingers. I brought towels and soap and conducted her to the brook. She called to Professor Small to join her, and her voice was crystalline. Professor Small declined and her voice was Batrachian. "'She is so hungry,' observed Miss Van Twiller. "'I am very thankful we are here at last, for we've had a horrid time. You see, we neither of us know how to cook.' I wondered what they would say to William's cooking, but I held my peace and retired, leaving the little brook to mirror the sweetest face that was ever bathed in water. End of chapter 7